Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see your faces. If you're new to Grace, this is your first time, welcome. If this is not your first time, welcome back. This is my favorite Sunday in the whole year. It's Easter, it's a party. We're celebrating Jesus is alive. And I would love for you to stand up and join us in worship. Let's do this. He is risen and we are all excited that you are here. Good and your mercy enduring forever. Sing, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy enduring forever. People from every nation, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, 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 we worship Fiel y tu misericordia eterna Señor eres fiel Señor eres fiel Y tu misericordia eterna Y es de toda Gente de toda lengua y nación De generación a generación Te adoramos hoy Aleluya
words that fade are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you And I'm not afraid For this day, this day that we can celebrate not only today, but all throughout our lives. This is the reason we celebrate you today, God. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace, thank you so much for singing with us. You guys can be seated. Hello again, friends. Guys, like I said, this is Easter Sunday. It's a party, and as a party, the house is going to be packed. So if you have space in the middle of your rows, please 
move to the middle so the ends of the roads can be easily accessible for the folks coming in. It's just a very small way for us to remind people that they're welcome here and they can always find a seat. So just help us with that. Um, I am Anna. If you never met me before, I am the Director of Compassion and Justice Initiatives here at Grace Community Church. And what is Compassion and Justice, Anna? I'll tell you. It's our ministry that it's focused on partnering with local and global nonprofits that are doing incredible work in the realms of social justice. All right? And um, in addition to the D.C. area nonprofits that we partner with, we also have partners all over the globe, like Central Africa, Guatemala, Brazil, Mexico, Germany, and we just love our partners and we invest a lot in them, in their uh, staff, in their work, and we absolutely love doing that. I had the awesome privilege of visiting some of our global partners this past month, and uh, it was such a joy, but I'm here to tell you that one of those trips, I actually went to Mexico. I went to Tecate, Mexico with Grace Youth. And um, it was a team of teens and leaders. And we went down to Mexico to build a house for a family in Tecate. And I, before I even share my story, I really want us to just give a huge shout out to Grace Youth because those teens went to a whole different country, speak a whole different language for the sole purpose of serving People, and I really loved it. So give them a hand. Grace Youth, you guys are awesome. I had a blast. Like traveling with those teens was the best thing I've done this year so far. So hard to top that. But back to my story. We're in Mexico and our job was very simple. We were supposed to build a house in three days from scratch. <laughs> Super easy. I was like, how are we going to do this? But our partners in Mexico, it's called Rancho La Paloma, and they have a project so well put together that we literally just have to show up at the job site and build a house. Like It's like a Lego piece all coming together. Super awesome. And it was amazing. We had three full work days there, and we worked with the family members. We worked with community members to really build a house for this family. Those teens right there, they were so incredible, serving hearts through and through. And it was so nice to like look around and see your kids just smiling through the whole hard work and like risking their high school level Spanish <laughs> to have a conversation with people and just seeing the confused faces and everyone else like, what are you talking about? It was just a blast, such a blast. But my favorite thing about this trip was the local community, like we were building this house for this family and their neighbors show up. Men and women in the neighborhood drop everything they were doing and they showed up every day of our work days to help build the house for their neighbors. One of the moments that I really got to carry my heart for good because I lost everything in that day was our very last day. We were sanding and painting the house and we look up the hill and we see those tiny humans just running down the hill, these guys, and they were so excited. They looked at us and they're like, we want to help paint our friend's house. And I lost it. I was crying and I was like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'm just going to cry here because it's so precious. The support from that local community was really one of the most precious things I've ever experienced in my job. And they really reminded me that that is compassion and justice in practice, daily compassion and justice right there. We do these things. We partner with projects, with nonprofits, with organizations, because we truly believe as a church that every person, it's worthy of community. They're worthy of love, of mercy, of support. And we really take this seriously, but also we could never do this if it wasn't for the resurrected Christ that we are celebrating this morning. This is what Easter is all about. And partnering with every single one of these organizations and others, it's Grace Community Church way to really spread God's love and truth. And it's just such an amazing thing that we get to do this as a church because every time that we take the moment to invest in building relationships and building local communities, empowering people, humanizing people, we get closer and closer to living in a world where the kingdom of God is right here. And that's what Easter is all about. So I wanted to take a moment to thank every one of you for being part of this work because literally... 
There's a little bit of every single one of you in every life that we touch with compassion and justice. And I love that. I love that we get to do this together. I don't want to spoil the message <laughs> because this is what Easter is about. But here's Pastor John <laughs> with the Easter message for all of you. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, she's very, she's very excited. Um, and we're thrilled to be able to partner with you and so many other people around the world. Well, it's Easter. Uh, happy Easter. Great to see you here. I mean, it's a huge day. It's a wonderful day. It's a day that changed the world. And my question is why? Like, like, why did it change the world? And for many of you who are like me, like I say this, I was birthed on a pew, right? I, I, you know, am I here just because, I mean, other than being a pastor, am I here just because it's tradition, it's culture? Like, what is the message behind Easter? There's so much noise out there about what, you know, God and Jesus and the Bible. Like, what is this really all about? And why does this, why does this day make such a big difference? I've said this, you know, um, many times that the, the least likely person to go to church in the United States of America is a young professional male who grew up in church, who grew up in church. And so I'm just wondering, given that statistic, do we kind of drift from the true meaning of it? Like, does it get lost sometimes in the weeds? You know what I'm saying? So what I would like to try to do today is clear it all away and look at what happened on Good Friday to Easter Sunday, and why the resurrection is like the exclamation point on Christ's message. Like, why is that so incredibly important? And my goal is, at the end of this, is that 100% of us would walk out of this room and say, you know what, I'm all in. Like, Jesus is going to be the very center of my life. Now, you might be saying, dude, you're swinging for defenses. I mean, that's like 100%. I mean, you could go with 50, you go with 60, but 100%, I'm just going to ask that you would give me 20 minutes. 20 minutes, not starting yet. I'll tell you when to start the clock. <laughs> I'm going to do some disclaimers first, okay, uh, about this, all right? So, uh, and, and, and then we'll, I'll let you know when to start the clock. All right, um, so here's the thing about Easter. It's really like opposite day, okay? If you, well, we, we should all be in our pajamas this morning, really. Our Easter, our Easter services all across the world should begin with goodbye, you know, so, so, something just so odd, something that is such a turn of events, because Jesus's, Jesus's message was a constant, steady drumbeats of opposites. Like he was kept inverting things over and over and over again. And that's what just makes it so absolutely unique and incredibly um, fascinating. I, I remember uh, years ago, I went, to, uh, I went to Nigeria. I loved it. I had a great time. I have so many wonderful, fond memories of being in Nigeria. It was just really, truly awesome. But I remember the bishop that we were there to work with, he was about 40 yards away from me. And I'm used to people you know, beckoning me or whatever you want to, beckoning, that's a nice word, uh, to come to them by like this type of motion, okay? But his motion, and apparently in Nigeria, the motion for you to go to them is this. And that really confused me. And I remember looking at him like, I couldn't figure out, are you telling me to go or come? And which one is it? So, so there's an opposite. And I want us to see something through a lens today. Because Easter is like Jesus is giving us this lens to see the whole world upside down. Uh, just think about all the many famous sayings that Jesus had that were opposite and, and, and how it flipped the script on us. You, 1 Corinthians 15, it's, it's a very long chapter in the Bible that Paul writes. It's all about Easter. It's all about Easter. And there's like this steady stream of, hey, he inversed this, and he inversed this, and he turned this upside down, and he turned this upside down. And then he gets to the end, and in three verses, like packed upon each other, he's talking about victory. Like this flipping of the script somehow brings victory to you and to me. And this is what I want to get down. I want to, I want to read this verse for you. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. You see this verse right here? <laughs> I think with the long and steady stream of opposites that Paul gives us, he's trying to communicate something to us that in order for us to understand this, we're going to have to put on like new glasses, new lens to see the power of this verse. We're going to have to be willing to flip the script. We have to be willing to see things upside down, okay? So let's look at this powerful verse the right way up. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, that is after this long and steady stream of opposites. This is the culmination of Jesus' teaching. Like, Jesus talked about flipping the script 
constantly throughout his life. He said things like this, death leads to life. That seems like opposite to me. I mean, there seems to be inversion. He says the first will be last and the last will be first. What, what are you talking about? Right? It's better to give than receive. There's no way that's true, right? We think about these things, how Jesus is making this constant flip. The greatest among you is going to be the servant of all. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus said he created something that we call jumbo shrimp. He didn't do that. I'm just making sure that you're still awake in all of this, right? But it, it's this constant and steady stream of this inversion. And you've got to at least some point ask yourself, why? And what does all of this have to do with Easter? Jesus tells us that we should pray for our enemies and we should bless our enemies. And I just got to say, to speak it out loud, that is highly unnatural. Like the first thing I think about when I encounter an enemy or somebody who slights me, I'm not thinking about blessing them or praying for them. Something else seems really natural that springs to my mind first. Okay, you don't have to raise your hand for the same way. But what is this that Jesus is talking about? He's talking about inverting something. All right, here we go. Start the clock. 20 minutes. See if we can make it. Uh, first, we need to deal with what happened on Friday. We call it Good Friday. It's the cross. It's the blood-stained cross. Blood. Here is what the book of Revelation says about blood. They won. They won the victory. How? Why? Because of the blood. Now, right there, everybody, um, is a big turnoff for me. Hey, blood. I'm just not comfortable with blood. I don't know about you. I like blood inside of your body, inside of my body. I just don't want to see it. When Krista was about six months pregnant and we went for the um, exam there at the doctor's office and they took vial after vial and it's that vacuum thing and it's just spurting, spurting. And I remember after the second one, I started seeing stars. My legs started feeling weak. And I, I, I actually grabbed the wall as I made my way to the waiting room. And I barely sat down before I was out like a light. Okay. So, I, you know, right there at the beginning, when we talk about blood being the main part of the story, and that's how the victory comes and the power of the blood, these great songs we sing, like, what is that? We are all sophisticated 21st century Washingtonians. Like, the blood is repulsive. We don't want to have anything to do with a story about blood. Nobody, nobody's going nobody's to read a story like that, right? Nobody's going to pay money for a story like that around the world. Nobody's going to have anything to do with blood. Okay, all right, okay. So let's get serious for a moment. What is up with the blood and what is the fascination with the blood in our lives? Now, all people throughout all time have done blood sacrifice for one reason. I'll say it again. All people throughout all time have done blood sacrifice for one, one, one reason. One, one very unique, important reason. And that's what I want to talk about today because this is what changes absolutely everything. And this is why the message of Jesus Christ on Easter is so radically important to our lives and our world. We need it. And that's why I'm hoping all of us will jump on board with it. Okay. So let me show you something. Here is, uh, I said this, it was practiced all over the world. I just give you one picture. Uh, this, uh, nope, the temple. Yeah, sorry. I went out of order. Let's go back to the other thing. That's right. Let's do the gazelles first. We share as much, not with gazelles, but we share as much as 99% of our DNA with some in the animal kingdom. And do you know that the animals do blood sacrifice? So here's the thing, and this is why it comes so natural to us. When you have a herd of gazelles here and a lion shows up, do you know what the gazelles do? They all start running and they push the weak gazelles to the edge of the pack so that the lions can feast on their blood sacrifice and keep them busy for a while while the powerful and strong gazelles get away. This is natural to us, very natural. Now let's do the Mayan temple. The Mayans and the Aztecs had blood sacrifice, both human and animal. Thousands every year, thousands every single year. Very simple concept. It's the same concept that exists throughout all humanity, one reason, all over the world. You have the powerless down here, the weak, the invalid, the outsider, the outcast, those who don't have power, those who are not strong. And you have the very few at the top of the pyramid, the powerful. 
the kings, the royal family, the few that had the power. And what you would do is you just sacrifice the one at the bottom to give power to the one at the top. Ernest Becker's book, his last book, Pulitzer Prize winner, okay? Highly recommend this book. His last book that he wrote, he actually died right before he finished it. His wife finished this book. It's called Escape from Evil. He gets into what is going on in humanity all throughout history. He gets into the psychology of it. And why is this so, why is this so deep inside of us? Why do we do this? And he, he's the one that says, right, it's all for one main reason, to sacrifice the weak and the powerless at the bottom to give power to those at the top. Now, in the Middle East, the land of the Bible, same exact thing was going on. They would sacrifice those at the bottom. So the Bible did not introduce blood sacrifice. Here's the thing. You've got to just, blood sacrifice, human and animal, predates the Bible. But like, this is what everybody was doing. Everybody was doing this. And they were all doing it for the same reason. They were paying off the gods. I want my life to go good, so I'll take somebody who doesn't have power or somebody who's an outsider or a stranger or something like that. I'll sacrifice them so that things will go well with me. And they did the exact same thing in the Bible. I have summarized this with one statement. This is, this is the statement that sums up blood sacrifice throughout history, throughout the world, throughout humanity, in the animal kingdom and in the human kingdom. This is what's happening. They were willing to sacrifice those at the bottom to give power to those at the top. Now, those people were so primitive. We never do that. It's the 21st century. We're in Washington, D.C. This, this is the most powerful, this is the most powerful city on the face of the earth. Thank goodness we would never, thank goodness this is not an instinct of humanity anymore, right? We would never sacrifice the powerless in order to give power at the top, to maintain the powerful status, to maintain their comfort. We would never do that. Everybody, I just want you to, just this, this is why I'm saying, I'm hoping that everybody jumps on board. There is so much noise out there. You and I hear so much stuff. Even those us inside the church, been in church, me birthed on a pew all my life. Sometimes I get lost in the weeds. You're talking to somebody about Jesus. Why do you believe in Jesus? Well, he rose from the dead. That tomb is empty. He is God. So you should change your whole life right now and believe in him. I just think that's a really bad place to start. Really bad place to start. Here's the place to start. Jesus Christ revolutionized our world by introducing us to a brand new idea that the world had never even thought of before. Never. And this is so deep in our nature. This is our first instinct. Nobody thought that sacrificing the people at the bottom was a bad idea until 2,000 years ago at a great global event that we call Easter, where Jesus Christ flips the script and says, you know what? That's a really bad thing. Actually, the way to life, the way to happiness, the way to joy, the way to peace is you got to invert everything exactly upside down. Jesus Christ did that. Now, let's go back to that Mayan uh, temple here real quick. So again, everybody, here, here's what's normal. Here's, here's humanity. Here is humanity before Jesus Christ like lays on us the greatest idea, the very core and foundation. You want to talk to, if you want to talk to somebody today about Easter, like, why did you go to church on Easter? Here's the first thing that you should say. Our world functions this way. The masses, the powerless at the bottom have to sacrifice being forced by the powerful up top. The blood always for all humanity and throughout all history has always flowed from the powers at the bottom to the top. And what does Jesus Christ do? The most powerful, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is at the top. Oh, wait, let's go back. He's at the top and his blood flows down. So actually what he's doing is he's inverting the entire script. He's flipping it upside down. Now let's flip it. And that's the way the world is. It's the upside down world. It's an inversion of everything. And if we will allow ourselves to understand the importance of that moment and inverting life, we will get the power and we will begin to understand why this is such an incredible victory for us. So there's all these Easter questions. I mentioned some just a few moments ago. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God come in flesh? Do you believe that the tomb is empty? Are you prepared right now? to give your entire life to Jesus Christ. I just think that is a really, really unhelpful. I mean, for me, it makes a lot of sense because my brain has been conditioned by this. I've been in church my entire life, so it just feels right. I just don't think it's helpful for us 
to drift so far from the meaning of Easter. I think a better message is this. Jesus Christ is the first uniquely only one that came along and said that script of sacrificing the powerless in order to empower the people at top is completely wrong. Now, here's my question. Do you feel like you could give your life to that? Like, is that something that inspires you? Would anybody raise, don't raise your hand. Would anybody raise your hand and say, no, I like the old script. I like the powerful abusing the weak. I like the few powerful just, this is the idea that Jesus Christ throughout history uniquely introduced to the world. And that is the message of Easter. And that is something that I'm hoping hundred percent of us will get behind and say, yeah, I'm for it. I'm for it. Matter of fact, I'm so for it. I'm going to make sure that I, that, that I tell other people that that is what the message of Easter. Think what would happen to our world. Servant leadership. Jesus is the epitome. Like if you open a dictionary, you should really see the picture of Jesus under servant leadership because there wasn't servant leadership until Jesus Christ introduced to us and made famous the whole concept of servant leadership. You want to work for a servant leader. You want to be raised by a servant leader. You you want all of your friends to be servant leaders because the opposite of servant leadership is terrible. It's terrible. It makes life miserable. We want our politicians to be servant leaders. Like we want it at the core of their being because that is what creates a wonderful, peaceful, just society that is so much better. Jesus Christ is the one that made all of this popular. Servant leadership. He changed the script 2,000 years ago. Can you give your life to that? Does our world need more of that? When you think about some of the greatest stories that we've ever heard, everybody, some of, the greatest, some of the greatest novels ever written or the movies you've ever seen, if there's a hero in that movie, I can guarantee you that hero is a servant leader based on Jesus Christ. 100%. 100%. percent To Kill a Mockingbird. Anybody read it? Seen it? To Kill a Mockingbird? There, there, it features a servant leader. All right, how about Top Gun? Like planes? Top Gun? Okay. What do we see? What's the dude's name in the Top Gun? I know it's Tom Cruise, but what is his, what is his handle? Maverick. Ah, I should have known that. Okay. Maverick. Okay. I'm not saying he's Jesus, but, <laughs> but, but uh, what, what I'm saying to you is, is the type that he's like, it, it's servant leadership. Les Mis. I love Les Mis. It's servant leadership. 2,000 years ago, before Jesus, before the cross, before the resurrection, this was not a popular idea. There weren't people writing novels and stories and stuff about somebody being a servant leader. It's like, oh, that's a hero. That's a hero. That's a hero. Heroes today are servant leaders because Jesus Christ flipped the script. And I think that is a great thing. I just think we need to go back to the core of what all this is about so we can all galvanize around this one idea that clearly, clearly is the idea that transforms the world. Servant leadership. Okay, servant leadership in our world, uh, it makes a massive, massive difference. But I want you to think about the world 2,000 years ago. I want you to think about the Roman Empire, the mighty, powerful Roman Empire who turned its sights against stamping out the movement of Jesus Christ. Like, how can anything stand against the Roman Empire? Nothing can stand against that. It's mighty. It's powerful. And they're like, we're going to stamp out Christianity. This is what they're going to do. They're going to stamp it completely out. And yet the followers of Jesus says, you know what? We get it so clearly, like they're closest to the action. So a lot of the noise got moved away. Like, yeah, okay, we get it. We get it. This is the path to life. You are calling us to be servant leaders in our world. We're not supposed to, like Jesus kept talking to him about, yeah, you're not supposed to lord your power over other people. No, you're supposed to be the servant. No, you're supposed to serve. No, you're supposed to pray for your enemies. So here's what happened. Here is why the first 300 years of the movement of Jesus Christ was so incredibly powerful. People call it the golden age of Christianity because it revolutionized and completely transformed the world. So Rome, Rome suffered a bunch of plagues back in the early days of Christianity, it suffered a bunch of plagues. Now, what do you do if you live in Rome? What do you do if you live in Rome and you're middle class or what much of a middle class? What do you do if you're upper class and you're living in Rome and there's a plague that strikes? You get out, you leave. Well, who's going to take care of all the sick people? We don't care about sick people. Let, I mean, kill them. Throw them out. Get rid of them as quickly as possible. I don't want to get sick. So people fled Rome. People just, just ran as quick as they went up to the mountains and the hills. I just got to get out of Rome. But you know what Christians did? You know what followers of Jesus did? Who Jesus made popular this idea of flipping the script and saying being a servant leader? They actually went into the city. 
They actually cared for people who were dying. And you know what happened? Some of the people actually survived. And this is why some historians say that Christianity grew so explosively in those first years because they ran into the city and they served and they cared. And some of those people that lived, they're like, oh, dude, I think I like this new idea. I think I like this thing about caring for the poor and the weak and the helpless. I don't think I like this old idea that we've always lived under about the powerful get to do whatever they want and oppress, and that's just the way the world is. And so they're like, oh my God, I think I'd like to become a follower of Jesus. And so now all of a sudden you had very few people in Rome because all these people have died, but the few that are left, many of them become followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, Rome had this thing that they did called exposure, okay? It's very popular. You probably heard of it before, but you had a baby. If it was a girl, it was a girl baby. They're not so much into the girl babies, and so they would just leave them out on a street or a sidewalk or at a place that they called the dump or something like that, and they would just, to die, to die. And, and the followers of Jesus said, hey, um, you know, these powerless little babies, these powerless little babies, we don't think that's cool. We don't think that's a good idea. We don't think they should just die. And so they went and started rescuing them and bringing them into their homes. And you know, a bunch of those little girls became followers of Jesus Christ too. They're like, oh, wow, this, this type of love shaped my life. And then, then these followers of Jesus had this idea. Let's invent something, which today we call orphanages. Do you know that's where it came from? Followers of Jesus invented something that we call orphanages. Actually, they also invented something else, something that we call hospitals. Has Christianity and the idea behind the resurrection of Jesus Christ had any positive impact on our world? Hospitals, orphanages, how about universities? They realize that people who have an education have a much better chance of actually, right, doing better in life, and they wanted to improve people's lives. So they created something called universities. Listen, everybody, you can read history books about this all day long. I've read a ton of them. Christians created orphanages. They created hospitals. They created universities. There was something in Rome called a Colosseum. Anybody heard about it before? Where blood sacrifice was celebrated. And Ernest Becker, the guy I talked about a minute ago, the Pulitzer Prize winner, ah, such a fantastic book, The Escape from Evil. Such a, he's not a Christian, okay? Just, 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 just like a psychoanalyst and a historian. It's just, it's an amazing book. You should, you should read it. But he talks about this. Here is why the Colosseum was so powerful. Because you got to go and you got to sit in the stands, and here's these people, these poor, helpless people down here. Some of them sometimes are gladiators, but you got to make the decision. Thumbs down, thumbs down. Thumbs, thumbs down, thumbs up. And when you got to say thumbs down, that made you feel powerful that you could say that person dies and I get to see their blood shed. Now, can you believe that Christianity overturned the power of the Colosseum? Like that's where they used to kill Christians and that's where they used to blood sacrifice all the time, all the time. And here we see that all of this has changed. And now when you go to the Colosseum, I actually had the opportunity to go there 10 years ago. There's this massive cross hanging in the Colosseum. Everybody, it's through servant leadership. It's the very fundamental idea. So what is Christianity about? Why should I follow? Why should I jump in? Because everybody, is there any other hope? Like humanity said, the only way to a good world is that the powerful oppress the powerless. And Christianity, Jesus Christ, came in on Easter Sunday and he says, nope, actually the way to life is uniquely different. He's the only one, uniquely one that did it. He said, it's actually when the powerful serve. So when the powerful serve, it totally changes everything that flips the script. Now I want to end with this. There was a Sunday school teacher, a young man. He was in his twenties. He taught a class, a bunch of kids, uh, taught them about Jesus. He talked to them about Jesus' values. He talked to them about what does the cross mean. He talked to them about serving others and servant leadership. He taught all these ideas. Here's the problem, everybody. He lived in a country that because of the color of his skin, he was treated with tremendous injustice. Tremendous injustice. And at a young age, this brilliant mind who taught Sunday school class, who taught these kids so much about Jesus Christ, at a young age, he was imprisoned for 27 years. Now, everybody, what happens when you get wrongfully uh, treated or you're wrongfully thrown in prison and you have 27 years in this little tiny cell to think about it? What happens? I mean, that's like, that's enough time for your rage and your bitterness to go nuclear. But here's the issue. This young man, who is now not young anymore, taught about Jesus Christ, taught about forgiveness, taught about servant leadership. He understood the basis of what really makes life work. And you know what's crazy? He was released from prison and he was elected the president of South Africa. 
And South Africa was preparing for a bloodbath. Why wouldn't it? Because normal humanity, normal humanity says that when you've been at the bottom and mistreated and now you're at the top, payback. You know what payback is. Payback. It's time. But this man, Nelson Mandela, was a true hero. And why was he a hero? He was a hero because he followed. Okay. Thank you. He was a hero. He was a hero because he learned about Jesus and he actually applied Jesus. to. It just wasn't something he talked about. It was something that he lived out. And now that's why we say Nelson Mandela is a hero, but he learned all that. He couldn't have done that. That wouldn't have been an awesome thing. But 2,000 years ago, there was a global event and we call it Easter Sunday. And the resurrection from Jesus from the dead after laying his life down was his exclamation point to the whole world that my path is the only path that actually works. Can you buy into that? Which way do you want to live? Do you want to live in the way that all humanity, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom has always lived? The powerful oppress the powerless. Or do you want to live the way Jesus Christ, who uniquely and the only person that ever did it, introduces to us this unique and brand new idea that the powerful should not oppress the powerless? Here is what Nelson Mandela said. I love this quote. And if you have not read books about Nelson Mandela, please do. It is extremely inspiring what he does. You will achieve more in this world through acts of mercy than you will through acts of retribution. And as Jesus Christ hung on the cross, bloodied, he said what? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So I wanted to speak this today just to simply say, do we want to get back to the very core? Like if you're here today and you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, do I really believe this stuff about Jesus? Should I really wrap my life around Jesus? Or maybe you have a friend or a family member who's like, yeah, I don't know about this Jesus and rising from the dead. It's kind of like, what, what is that? Uh, who's the guy up in the little thing that comes out of the ground up in Pennsylvania, right? I mean, is that, is that, I, mean, I hear people say like, is that, is, what is his name? Puxatani, Puxatani, Puxatani. I mean, is that, is that what it is? No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. It is the most unique idea that our world has ever seen that will actually straighten our world out. So that's what I want to ask you. Will you today, maybe you're already a follower, will you consider re-energizing your life and focusing on this one Easter fact? This is what the resurrection means. That the way of Christ that he introduces works. If you're not a follower of Christ, would you consider wrapping your entire life and say, yes, I'm going to be his follower from now and forevermore because not only is it going to change my world, proven, proven better, but you know what also happens? And we know this, and I'm going to talk a lot about this in the next few weeks. It is proven to make your life better exponentially. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. I thank you so much for your word, for your goodness. I thank you, Jesus, that you came. You came to show us the way. The only way that this world is going to work and work well, you flip the script. Father, for all of us in this room, we're thinking about, hey, it's it's Easter. I I just, like, what's this all about? How do I re-energize my life? I've been in church all my life. God, help us to focus on this one fact the power of Easter. For those of us in the room, like, "Ah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe kind of, sort of. Maybe Jesus is one of many things in my life. Oh, no. Lord, um, help all of us to see that this is the very foundation that we stand upon in order for our lives to be everything that you created them to be. Help us and bless us, Lord, please. In Christ's name. Amen. Uh, Everybody, I want to say that we're going to sing this great song. If you want somebody to pray with you, have a wonderful prayer team right over here. They'd be happy to pray with you. If you're trying to make a decision about becoming a follower of Christ, the prayer team be happy, happy, happy to pray with you. But this song we're going to sing is called At the Cross. And there's a line in there that says, I am in awe of you. And it repeats it. I am in awe of you. Now, why? Why should we be in awe of Jesus? He's the only one. scour the history books. He is the only one that flipped the script like this for all people. You know why? Because he loves all people. Let's stand and sing.
I just want to say thank you for joining us on this Easter service and uh, want to let you know that next Sunday we're beginning a new series called Brave New You where we're going to talk about how what happened today 2,000 years ago Jesus's resurrection can create the change that we're all looking for as pa Pastor John mentioned it's a process and we want to invite you into that process over the next couple weeks and we hope that you join us for that a series called Brave New you. Now, if this is your first time, I would love to meet you right over here under this screen along with Anna uh, just for a few minutes. And we want to say again, thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you next Sunday. Have a great week.